Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our webinar tonight, Climate Change, Health and Practical Sustainability. My name's Jenny Pearson, and I'm an Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on tonight and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Our presenters are Tonight are Dr. Sujata Allen, she's a GP in Armadale, and Dr. Gerard Brownstein, and he's a GP in Benalla, North East Victoria. Um, there will be a, a quick evaluation that will pop up at the end of the webinar, and we'd love it if you could fill in um, that for us. This event is accredited with RACGP and ACRAM, so um, all GPs attending will have points uploaded. Um, and this will be recorded and there'll be a copy of it um, on our website in our education library. All right, I'll hand over to you, Sajada. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Um, so I might share my slides. Can everyone see that? I'm going to take that as a yes. 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 Yes, that's um, good. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks so much for organising this, Jenny. Um, and uh, yeah, before I go much further, I also want to acknowledge um, that we're all on Aboriginal land, probably in different parts of Australia at the moment, but um, acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, yeah, and elders, past and present and future. And it's, I guess it's so important when considering this topic, especially that we um, think about Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous land use, because um, there's so much knowledge there that we can be learning from. Um, so this is, we're going to be talking about climate change, health and practical sustainability. So I'm, I'm a GP in Armagen Aboriginal Health Centre in Armadale. Um, and I'm going to be talking about more of the climate change and health part of things and hand over to Gerard Brownstein, who's a GP in Victoria, who's going to be talking about more of the practical side of things. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to um, let you know this, this beautiful artwork. Um, so I'm part of a project called the Armadale Climate and Health Project, which is um, partly sort of organising this webinar as well. Um, and this artwork was done by a local man, Tyler, um, and it's meant to represent so the um, Anawan um, symbol, the um, echidna is in the middle and then this artwork is meant to represent climate and health and the interaction between people and country. So also wanted to acknowledge all the organisations that have sort of been involved somewhat. So the Armadale Climate and Health Project is um, a project that's funded by ADAPT New South Wales. Um, and it's basically a project to run six workshops and a community festival. Um, and it's a partnership between Armagen Aboriginal Health Service, the University of New England and Sustainable Living Armadale. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec, but also wanted to really thank the New England Division of General Practice and the PHN for helping put together this and also Doctors for the Environment for all the work that um, everyone does as volunteers in that organisation. So, really briefly what the Armadale Climate and Health Project is. So it's um, basically um, a series of workshops that is really trying to answer the question about how can we build community connections and resilience in the face of climate change, um, improve our health and put Indigenous knowledge at the centre. So it's really trying to bring all those things together. Um, and my colleague and I, Jen Hamilton from UNE, um, went into this basically we didn't have any answers we just had this question of how can we actually start to bring all these things together in a practical way on the ground and we we've done a bunch of community consultations um, and have done a couple of workshops so far and there's more planned for, for the rest of the year um, so to learn more about that please go to our website i'm um, and yeah it'd be, loved, it'd be great to hear your feedback and connect with the project as well so it'll be running until the end of the year but we're hoping that there's going to be some practical projects um, like um, working on land access on private property with Aboriginal people. Um, there's another one on food, local food networks, and hopefully they'll be ongoing um, after the project finishes as well. So what we're going to talk about today, um, I'm going to cover a bit of the evidence and research um, and really just looking at a couple of 
direct effects of climate change in Australia. So looking at the recent bushfires, looking at heat waves and then drought and mental health effects. Briefly touch on the environmental impact of healthcare as a, as a whole and then hand over to Dr Gerard who's going to talk about practical sustainability. And originally when we planned this webinar, um, well this event, it was going to be face to face but of course COVID got in the way. Um, so we really wanted to open up the floor at the end to hear your ideas and um, think about the next steps as well. So as an, as an overview, I mean, back in 2009, um, the Lancet um, Medical Journal came out with this article about climate change and stated that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. So I guess just to frame this like it's, this is not a um, climate change impact on health is not a new, um, a new discovery. It's sort of been evolving over the years um, and it's very well recognised that it's having a massive effect right now. Um, there was a more recent 2019 report of the Lancet Countdown on Health um, and the overview of that, um, that report in very, in a, I mean, it talked about lots of things obviously, but key facts included um, that one degree of, one degree Celsius of warming is already having major effects and that it's primarily driven by fossil fuels. Um, won't go into too much more detail there. Um, but yeah, I guess amongst Australian organisations, um, climate change is widely declared as a health emergency. So these are some of the organisations in Australia that have come out to, I guess, state this and state that this is this is not something that we need to think about um, in 10, 20 years time. This is really impacting our health right now and it's a health emergency. So that includes my college, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, um, RACP, AMA, Australasian College of Emergency Medicine and many others as well. Um, now over time, I mean no talk on climate change would be complete without a, a graph showing some terrifying figures. Um, so we can see in the top corner, in, this was from 2019 and we're already about 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures. So things are I mean, when, when I started talking about this, um, I think it was only like maybe seven or eight years ago and we were talking, I sort of was always talking in the future, like, oh yeah, these bad things are gonna happen in the future. But unfortunately it, now the future is very much the present. And I think, yeah, none of us, um, yeah, all, all of us, I guess, especially living in the country and living in Australia have really felt the impacts of climate change already. So this is a, a graphic from the New England um, Journal of Medicine um, and just painting a broad brush stroke on the, um, the different impacts of climate change on health. Uh, so we're not going to go into all of them. I'm just going to sort of hone in on a couple of them, but in very um, broad terms. So basically increasing levels of carbon dioxide um, such as those released from fossil fuel combustion mm. um, leads to rising temperatures. Um, rising sea levels and extreme weather events um, and that's obviously like the impacts on health are obviously mediated by a whole host of factors um, such as um, the demographic, socioeconomic, environmental factors so obviously for countries quite well off they're going to be um, in a better state to deal with some of these effects. Mm. Um, what's the baseline sort of poverty level all that kind of thing um, has an impact um, but the in the effects on health um, can be broadly classified into these different effects. So the effects of extreme weather events, uh, the effect of heat on health, air quality, and then water quality, food, food supply, and then changing distribution of infectious diseases as well. And the bigger social factors like changing migration, um, access to food, all those sort of bigger flow on effects which are kind of harder to quantify but probably have the biggest effect overall. So I'm going to talk more specifically um, to something that we can all probably relate to. So this is a photo that I took um, back in 2019 when I was stuck in a bushfire down in Victoria. Um, this was watching the fire roll in um, over the hill. So bushfires we know back in 2019-20 bushfires were 
catastrophic and there's something that we've never experienced before to that degree in Australia. Um, there was 5.4 million hectares of land. There was uh, 33 people died in those fires, about 3 billion animals, they, they estimate. Um, and I think 37% of all national park estates. So it's, and these, the, these extreme fire conditions were on a background of severe drought um, and rising temperatures. So all factors that occur naturally in Australia but are um, worsening in, with, with climate change. So there's an increase in extreme fire weather in both in terms of intensity and frequency. So there was a study after that bushfire looking at um, what effect the air pollution from the smoke had on health. So this was, this was looking specifically at um, PM 2.5, which is a very small um, particle about the site, um, very many times smaller than human hair. Um, and this, this study was a, um, a kind of estimate study that looked at the distribution, the population distribution of, um, of PM 2.5 and um, looking at, like we, we know quite a lot about PM 2.5. We know that it's um, a class one carcinogen. We know um, the effects on health vary, um, like they, they cause acute respiratory issues, they cause acute cardiovascular issues and also chronic disease as well, like chronic lung disease, heart disease, um, increased risk of cancers, even um, type 2 diabetes, low birth weight. So there's a lot of known health effects of PM 2.5. So these were putting all this data into, um, into the population exposure of PM 2.5 in association with these bushfires. So just to um, show you a bit more detail of what PM 2.5 is, so it's just very, very tiny particles basically. And the, the dangerous thing about these particles are this, is that they're so small that they can be breathed in deep into the lungs and get into the bloodstream. So then they have like a pro-inflammatory um, effect on the body and that's how they cause so many different effects. Um, and PM 2.5, it's released by a number of different things such as fossil fuel combustion, bushfire smoke, um, sort of uh, car exhaust, different kinds of sources like that. So this study, show, um, it estimated the excess deaths, hospitalizations for cardiovascular and respiratory disease and asthma and emergency department presentations from smoke exposure. And it looked at New South Wales, Queensland, ACT and Victoria, just over that bushfire season. So from the 1st of August, 2019 to the 20th of Feb, 2020. And it also looked at the um, estimated population exposure to PM 2.5. So there's a number of air quality monitors um, across Australia that monitor different, um, different types of air pollution and PM 2.5 is one of those types. So this study um, looked at all those things and it found that it, there was about 417 excess deaths, over 1,000 cardiovascular hospitalisations and over 2,000 respiratory hospitalisations and about 1,300 asthma emergency presentations from this increased level over the bushfire period. This, again, so this shows um, uh, the um, PM 2.5 levels um, over the bushfire season. And you can see, on, especially on those really bad bushfire days, that the spike was many, many times higher um, than the national air quality standard. So, and those of us, um, I think a lot of people actually probably learnt more about air pollution in the bushfire times because we could see on, there was like a, um, a table you could see how if the air quality was hazardous um, or safe to go outside. Um, so yeah, on the, the level of those, of the air quality in, on those days was up to, I think 14 times um, the historical population rated mean 24 hour value. So many times higher than what we've experienced before. And this just breaks down that data by different states. So you can see again, um, I mean, coming from a, a New South Wales perspective, because that's where I live, um, there was, yeah, you can sort of see the different numbers there. But they, yeah, these kinds of, I guess these health impacts are not something that you see, like it's, it's not um, 
something that is so obvious as a fatality, which is obviously really tragic from a bushfire. But these are also sort of deaths that are a little bit more hidden. Um, but often the deaths, um, for example, from air pollution, are, they might be hidden, but they're, they're far sort of, they're far greater um, than the direct effects, like the burns and the fatalities from the bushfires. Um, and impacts on, like the general impacts of air pollution on health, um, it's going to be those people who are already at risk, so those with chronic diseases, children, the elderly, um, asthma, it, those people who are already already have those um, pre-existing conditions that are going to be more affected. There was another study around that time that um, so this the last study that I talked about that's more that's more um, a sort of epidemiological study looking at the population levels. This one um, was done by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, and it looked just at um, the data from um, emergency departments and also from pharmacies and a number of different other things as well. So they found um, that in emergency departments, there was a clear increase in respiratory presentations by up to 86% in some, some cases um, over the bushfire season. There was also, they looked at sales data from pharmacies um, as another marker of um, respiratory burden in the community and increase in salbutamol, salbutamol sales. So that was, that's Ventolin or Asmol by up to 144%. Um, from a mental health point of view, again, that's sort of hard to quantify, but um, they did some surveys showing that more than half of Australian adults felt anxious or worried by the fires, which is, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, but that was reflected in an increase in lifeline calls. And also there was an additional Medicare item number for mental health affected by bushfires, which had up to 500, almost 500 claims per week. So that's just some of the, these are just over the bushfire season as well. So showing some of the impacts on health. So I wanted to move on and talk a bit about heat waves now. Um, and it seems funny talking about heat waves now when it's, it was minus four this morning, but it does get hot in summer. Um, and um, this was, this newspaper um, article was back in 2018 when I was living and working, um, well, I was working in Western Sydney. Um, and at that time, um, Sydney apparently was the hottest place on earth. So heat waves with climate change, we know are getting longer, hotter, um, and more frequent as well. And out of all um, climate change's impacts on health, the direct impacts on health, heat waves um, are sort of seen as the, the silent killer and they probably account for more um, sort of uh, more deaths from any other kind of natural or environmental cause in Australia. So there has been some studies as well reflecting this. Um, so back in 2009, which was the time of the Black Saturday bushfires, um, they also did some, uh, there was some research about the impact of heat on health. Um, and they found that um, there was, yeah, so the, the Melbourne heat wave around the Black Saturday bushfires resulted in about, in 374 excess deaths. Um, in Victoria and nearly 500 excess deaths across Southeast Australia. And that was in addition to um, the 173 people who died directly in the fires. Um, so the effects on, um, of heat on health, there's obviously the really direct effects like heat stress, dehydration, heat stroke. Um, but the big, the big impact really is the um, exacerbations of chronic disease, for example, like heart disease, lung disease, renal disease, and there's even some evidence to show increased preterm birth and low birth weight as well. So that puts increased stress on ambulance services and you can see um, a 46% increase in ambulance call outs um, in that heat wave as well. So you can see again in this, um, from this data, the, high, the higher and more prolonged the heat wave is, the more um, ambulance call outs there are for direct heat effects like heat stress and dehydration. Another study in Sydney showing pretty much a similar kind of thing. This one looked at ED visits, emergency department visits 
for heat effects and dehydration um, and ambulance call outs and um, again an increase in mortality and ambulance call outs um, with heat waves as well and it's again it's the people who already have pre-existing conditions and the elderly like especially those age 75 and older that have that are the most affected um, and there's been some kind of thinking about this um, about the effects of heat waves on health and some some kind of argument of or is it just mortality displacement so is it is it the people who were like maybe going to die in the next days or weeks just died earlier um, and there's probably a little bit of that but they um, there's sort of research from big places like in France and Chicago when they had huge heat waves and many thousands of people dying um, that mortality display, displacement was only a small percentage of the excess deaths so there's these are heat waves are killing people that might not have they might not have already been at the end of life um, and right now in in Canada and USA um, there's a heat wave and um, there's this is just a snapshot from the Guardian article just from um, earlier this month just um, about how impacts how this heat wave is impacting people right now um, and um, most of the deaths in this heat wave were amongst older people as well but then also people like outdoor workers, pregnant people, children are also at increased risk as well. So uh, drought, this again we know a lot about around here unfortunately. This is a photo of my mum's property um, back in the drought in 2019. Um, that's her horse charger and you can see that there wasn't much grass around. Looks very different now luckily because we had a lot of rain. So not surprisingly, drought has drought, drought is a big stress among farmers and I don't, I don't feel like, um, I mean, it's good, we obviously need research as well, but um, some often these findings you think, oh, well, that's pretty self-explanatory, but it's also good to sort of have backup um, and know that the kind of self-explanatory things are backed up by research as well. Um, so this is a, an article um, in, the, in the Medical Journal of Australia um, looking at the data from Australian Rural Mental Health Study collected from 2007 2000 to 2013, and that covers um, the area of the, the covers the millennium drought um, time as well. Um, and they looked at things like drought-related stress, community drought-related stress, and general psychological distress using a K10, and they found that the most um, impacted people were young people, so young farmers, especially both un under 35, if they both lived and worked on a farm, so they couldn't really get away and this was their whole life. Um, obviously, if they're under greater financial hardship, that's gonna add to their stress levels. And the more remote they were, um, the higher the drought-related stress. So this is useful in terms of, like if we're treating people like this, and also, um, I guess, looking at trying to improve these people's access to mental health, support or financial support, all that kind of thing to try and relieve their distress. Um, there was some also some research done after the Victorian Black Saturday bushfires, um, and that's looking at psychological outcomes. And that was this study was done about three to four years after the Black Saturday bushfires. This photo again I took at the when I was stuck in the bushfire down in Victoria some friends. Um, so they found this, this study looked at, um, they grouped people into high affected communities. So this was, these were communities where there was a number of fatalities and a lot of property loss. And the medium affected was the people who, there was a lot of property loss and maybe a couple of fatalities, but not as severe. And the low affected were pretty minimally affected by the bushfires. Um, and they found that overall actually people people are pretty resilient. So that was, I guess, a positive thing um, that a lot of people went through this horrible experience and actually bounced back and um, so, like their mental health was quite good afterwards. But there was also a significant um, minority of people who experienced direct mental health effects even a couple of years down the track. So you can see the um, prevalence of, um, of PTSD. I mean, the baseline level of PTSD is also pretty high, but also specifically the fire-related PTSD was 
um, was quite high, more so in the high affected communities, which which makes sense. I mean, if you're fearing for your life and um, having a really um, very personal effect of the fire, then that's going to increase your chances of getting something like PTSD. Um, and there was also um, more incidents of things like heavy drinking in the communities that were more high affected as well. And this is reflected, there was some other, there's been some other studies, like, for example, after the Canberra bushfire, they looked at children affected by that um, and there was pretty high, um, there was, yeah, I think up to 40, I won't quote any numbers because I can't remember, but um, there was a high incidence of PTSD after that as well amongst children. So after all that kind of um, bit sort of heavy topic um, and yeah, I mean there's I guess I guess overall there's there's sort of more and more research um, confirming the impacts of climate change and health, which we have known for a long time, but it's it helps to put numbers and faces on on um, on things that we do know. Um, so now we need to talk about solutions, otherwise it's all a bit depressing and it's a bit overwhelming as well. So wanted to talk, um, move it on to sustainable healthcare now. And before I hand over to Dr. Gerard, um, wanted to briefly um, cover this Lancet article. So this came out um, a couple of years ago, um, and this is the first time that the carbon footprint of Australian healthcare has been estimated, which is really helpful. Um, so it came out in the Lancet in 2018, um, and they basically did um, an econ observational economic input output life cycle assessment um, of all the different aspects of healthcare. And they looked at all the different kind of um, sectors, I guess, and looked at their carbon output. Um, and I guess why is it important to look at the carbon footprint of Australian healthcare is because I mean we're in health because we want to improve people's health, but if our health system is contributing to um, something that's very directly impacting people's health, then it sort of doesn't really make very much sense. So I think it's definitely the responsibility of healthcare practitioners to kind of clean up our own house as well as looking looking broader as well. But um, yeah, looking at the impact, the impact, um, the broader impact of delivering healthcare and try to reduce that as much as possible. So good news for GPs. We are only a tiny slice of the carbon impact of the healthcare system. And overall, um, the Australian healthcare system accounts for about 7% of Australia's annual emissions. So it's pretty, it's pretty sizable. 7% is quite a lot. Um, and overall, as you can see, it's public hospitals that are the biggest chunk. Pharmaceuticals also come in, they come in second. Um, private hospitals, probably coming third and then all the other other bits and pieces are over here. Um, so general practice, I think we we have a really important role because um, I guess for one thing, really good general practice can keep people out of hospitals, which will reduce the impact of public of um, carbon emissions on public with public hospitals. But also, I mean we still have a pretty we have a still a significant um, percentage and we can do a lot within our own practice. Um, to reduce the impact of our healthcare, um, as well as doing all the other fantastic things that we do every day. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Gerard Brownstein to take us through what he's done in his practice. Oh, um, thank you very much, Sajata, and thanks for your, your talk. Um, and welcome to everybody out there in freezing Armadale and the, the hinterland. Um, I'm, a, I'm a general practitioner in Benalla, which is a uh, town of about 10,000 people in northeast Victoria. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we experienced the, the fires, not directly, um, the recent um, terrible summer fires, but, but we, we got to enjoy the smoke for, for many months. Um, so, Sir so John, we just go to the next slide. Um, so, well, I've, I've been a general practitioner for about 30 years in Benalla. It's amazing how time has sort of 
flown by. We're talking about fossil fuels, but I never really thought I'd ever become a fossil. But um, there you go. I, after 30 years, I'm almost qualified as one. Um, we're we're a, a busy, uh, well-run, well-resourced um, uh, private general practice. Uh, we have uh, six principles of which I'm one. So we're 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 doctors and business owners, really, at the end of the day. Um, and we have we employ doctors. We've got administration staff, and um, uh, we've got our practice nurses as well. So we've got quite a big team. Thank you, Sajava. Um, our practice meetings. You know, you, I, when when the issue of uh, climate change and sustainability came up in our practice, I, I didn't think there would be so much controversy. But but um, you know, this uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper sort of came to mind. We we have our practice meetings once a month. We usually have dinner together, and I was surprised how much uh, pushback there was, um, even to discuss sustainability um, in our practice. Um, there was myself and one other, uh, one of the other principals, um, you know, who uh, felt strongly about this. Um, but I think um, we sometimes sort of assume that that uh, our colleagues are equally invested in um, sustainability and health and the environment, and you know, the, uh, I guess the, the the social issues around climate change as much as we are. But in fact. Um, you know, I, I think we're probably a little bit in the minority. I think most um, have an opinion uh, about climate change, but life is busy, and um, uh, not the, the inclination is not to really get too heavily involved. Next slide, thanks. Um, so, but eventually we carried the day, and um, after their practice meeting. Um, we we agreed that we would have a look at sustainability in our own carbon footprint, um, but the proviso was that we really weren't to spend much money, and um, we didn't want this to be a political um, exercise. So, with that in mind, as as a group, that's what we decided to do. So, our aims initially were um, to reduce our carbon emissions as close to zero as possible. Um, to, and to advocate for personal action towards a more environmentally sustainable future by, by basically just doing what we were going to do. So the caveat to all this is, is that uh, it had to make sound business sense. And you know, I would suggest that in general practice these days, particularly where there's a lot of corporate practices, um, the bottom line does matter. And it's, it's often much easier to engage um, your colleagues uh, talking about um, uh, sustainability in the in a general practice setting, if it if it has that carrot of uh, that it actually makes very good business sense. Um, most practices these days have you know professional um, or semi-professional practice managers, um, and their job is to is to uh, you know look at the bottom line. So they're they're a great ally in in um, you know, progressing this along. Thanks, Sujata. Um, but like most things in life, we we uh, we thought we had all the answers. We thought we knew how our our practice operated. You know, where the where the dollars went basically, and um, how you know we prided ourselves as having an efficient um, practice from the point of view of what we consumed and um, and how we consumed it. Um, but the great American philosopher Donald Rumsfeld, who has recently passed away, you might remember that the, the Second Gulf War is the Secretary of um, State, um, Secretary of Defence, sorry, in the in the American uh, government at the time. Um, and one of the most sensible things he he did say about the Iraq War was that there are known unknowns. Uh, and there are things that we know we don't know, and that's pretty much where we came from. Next slide, thanks, Sajava. Um, so we we contracted a um, an energy audit company um, to come into our practice and to 
uh, run an audit about um, how we used energy, what, our, what was wasting energy, and to give us some priorities in a financial sense, particularly, um, with, with what we might do you know, if we found anything particularly interesting. Um, fully expecting that really for $1,500, we would um, you know, probably find that we were as good as we thought we were. Um, next slide, thanks, Mr. Tavern. Um, so what we found, this is in 2016, was that our average daily um, energy consumption in the building um, uh, was about 170 kilowatt hours per day, uh, which is probably the equivalent of um, eight to 10 households. Um, and you know the amount of carbon dioxide emitted just, just through our energy use um, was about 79 tonnes. Um, you might remember those that are old enough, um, the, the famous black balloon ads where we had balloons of carbon dioxide sort of squeezing out from behind the fridge. Um, this is probably going back about 12 years ago, um, a government campaign to get people to think about where they might be wasting energy and its actual um, effect on generating carbon emissions. So you know that 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 equated to you know, these about four liter balloons, um, you know, one point five million of them. Next, thanks, Sir David. Um, the findings were quite interesting. We the, the first thing was that we had this energy waste um, uh, during the night, which is which was a background energy waste of about thirty kilowatt hours per day. Uh, that that's a uh, 30 kilowatt hours is um, about probably what a um, uh, a big home would use with three or four bedrooms, um, and this this equated to about 14,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide a year, which we didn't know what it was, um, and the money side of that was four thousand um, dollars. So we. That, that that was that was the energy waste that we we couldn't quite um, work out where it was going. Um, we we sort of narrowed this down to perhaps the um, the phone system and a malfunctioning air exchanger, uh, but we did wonder whether the church who had a building next door were um, in their um, community hall might have actually been um, siphoning off our energy to grow marijuana, but we we could never prove that. Um, but um, uh, being as it may, we, we um, took that on board and, and had these things dealt with. Uh, next slide, thanks, Sujata. So the surprise energy waste was um, uh, all over the place really, but, but we had a boiling billy in the tea room which is running 24 hours, um, seven days a week, just boiling away uh, just in case someone turned up you know, at two o'clock in the morning and wanted a cup of hot tea. Next, thanks. Um, in our tea room, um, we had a, uh, a split system air conditioner and a central, a big central air conditioner uh, zone through the whole building. And, and these were fighting each other. Um, you can see that, the, that, that that's an infrared um, sensor held there. Um, the split system is trying to cool. It's it's putting out air at about eight degrees there, which is pretty good for an air conditioner. And um, the, our central system is trying to heat, um, putting out air at about 20 degrees. So you know clearly a a, a wrestle which um, results in great inefficiency. Next, thanks. Um, the other the other thing hiding around the corner of our surgery is a a 630 litre hot water service um, sitting there. Um, this went through to our treatment room where occasionally we use some, some warm water um, uh, for ear syringes and these, these sort of things. But basically that, that, um, that was wasted and that, that was on 24 hours a day as well. Next, thanks. Uh, our front door, um, the, the drafts there that was just sort of opening and closing. You know, you can imagine every time a, a, a 
a visitor comes in, that door opens, all the air conditioning air sort of just flows straight out. Um, and, you know, we, we th th this was also a, a great sort of area of, of wastage. Next, thanks. Now, these are just some thermal images which um, show heat leaking. Um, we can see uh, on the, uh, the top left, there's, there's a draft around a window um, with, with the, the bright area being heat loss. Um, top right is a skylight with, um, sorry, with uh, that, that's just looking at the roof where there's a, a, um, uh, a, a insulating bat that's missing. And um, that little bright spot is just heat leaking out of the building in winter and, and um, heat getting into the building in summer. Then at the bottom, we've got um, poorly sealed doors and uh, also the skylight there, which is just beaming in um, radiant heat during summer. Next, thanks. Um, so, um, Echo Master provided us with a with a list of things that we might consider um, uh, with a with the potential energy savings and the return of investment in years. So th there were things that we didn't do. Um, uh, for example, the the um, uh, double glazing uh, that was going to take about 41 years to pay off, and the energy saving per day was about five kilowatts. So um, kilowatt hours, so we, we didn't do that. Um, but we did um, start with the simple things which had an immediate effect, which was the draft proofing, um, shading and ceiling insulation. Um, so they, they were done um, straight up, sort of looking at the, the envelope of the building. Um, and then the next step we did was to um, uh, take on the air conditioning and um, look at look at how we might um, deal with that. So you know, a, a fifty thousand um, dollar split systems through throughout the building, uh, decommissioning the, our central air conditioner. Um, we thought that might save us about twenty three kilowatt hours a day, but take about sixteen years to pay off. Um, so we, we did that first before we put the solar array um, so that we could see what sort of size array we needed once we'd taken care of you know, energy and efficient um, uh, heating and cooling and doing what we could about the sort of the envelope of the building. Thanks, Shitava. Um, so um, we, we did some simple things. We went around the building, um, we reset all the thermostats um, on this um, uh, new air conditioning system um, and police this because invariably people walk in the morning and say, wow, it's, uh, it's too cold or it's too hot and they dial up the air conditioner. So um, our staff did, did um, have a bit of a campaign to make sure that we, we kept um, uh, to these temperatures, um, 21 degrees in winter and 24 degrees in summer. We probably could have gone a bit lower in winter, but you know, we're a little soft and in vanilla. Um, we, in in doing the energy savings and the the practice, you know, as I mentioned, there was a diversity of views, but we're very pleased that um, fifteen hundred dollars had already resulted in you know many thousands of dollars of savings. So we changed our energy provider and we purchased um, uh, green energy um, from our local energy supplier. So 100% renewable energy from the grid, uh, which at the time had a cost premium of about 8.2 cents per kilowatt hour. So, you know, probably another 30 or 40 percent um, above the the cost of the energy that we were purchasing at the time. Um, we and, and we sort of also got rid of the old inefficient hot water service and uh, we started looking at solar panels. Um, thanks, Sujata. Hello. Have I disappeared? You haven't, you're still there. 
Oh, okay. Um, oh, Sujata's so, so, so disappeared um, with the slide. Sujata's so so. disappeared. <laughs> Yeah. I, think I'm, I think I'm back again. Sorry, my internet dropped out. Oh, that's okay. Oh, okay. We can hear you. Sorry. Oh, there you go. Is it, are the slides still here? Yeah, no, thank you. So, look, this, yes. this, this, this is a recent energy audit we've done, which is looking back, um, uh, back to prior to doing the energy audit and then right up to um, the end of this summer. And I've divided that up. Um, you can see that there's winter and summer there with the kilowatt hours um, per day. So in 2015, uh, per day we, in winter, we were using 223 kilowatt hours. Um, in 2017, we installed the new split system air conditioner. And uh, that, that basically halved the energy use um, sort of in that year. Um, so that, that was that was pretty telling that we had a very inefficient system. Um, in September 2018, we installed a 20 kilowatt solar array, um, and that that also resulted in a in a really quite a huge um, drop. So that 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 took the, compared to 2015, reduced our energy use. Um, down to 70% 70, 70 of, of what it had been. Um, and particularly in summer, the solar array is running. Um, you know, our energy use in this building that previously would use um, several hundred kilowatt hours uh, was running at the lean, um, the lean rate of, of a, a pretty frugal um, suburban home. Um, and that that was essentially just getting rid of um, inefficient air conditioning and using solar panels. Sujati, so you've disappeared again. Are you there, Jenny? Sorry, oh, I'm still yes, here. Yes, I am. Wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> um, so look, there, there there are some other things we did. Um, we we looked at our waste management and we put recycling bins in at recycling trays throughout the surgery. Um, and in that first year, we reduced our well, clinical waste just by um, uh, being particularly careful about where it went uh, and what we did with it. Um, we reduced our clinical waste um, by almost sort of 9% despite doing all of our minor procedures back at the clinic. We have been doing it in the hospital. A general waste, um, we also reduced that by 18,000 litres per year. Uh, increased our recycling by three big bins a, a fortnight, and we had one organic bin a fortnight. Next, thanks, Sujata. Um, we reduced our paper use. Um, we, we bought a new fax machine that went straight to email. We reused all our papers, um, you know, for for non-confidential um, uh, things, we did double-sided printing. Um, uh, all of our patient results were emailed, um, specialist letters were emailed. Um, our reminder system was paperless. Um, so just in the printing and stationery um, for the first year, uh, including the general and the clinical waste, um, you know, we saved $3,000. Next, thanks, Sujata. Uh, we we also looked at our office. They're, they're, these are our little individual pigeonholes. I'm sure you've seen similar things in your own place of work. Uh, this is all advertising. Um, nobody reads it. It, it. it basically goes sort of unopened into the bin most of the time. Um, so we we just um, let all of the advertisers know. Um, that we weren't accepting any more advertising, and those that didn't take any notice, we just returned it to them. Um, and that's that's reduced a huge amount of uh, paper that comes in and out of our surgery. Uh, next, thanks, Shujata. Um, sample drawers also, you know, we, we all had samples in our rooms. We, we had, um, every time a, a drug rep would come and visit us, they'd leave samples, uh, we had them coming out of their ears and we um, we put a put a stop to that. Um, I think now through accreditation, 
um, you know, we, we've had to deal with that anyway. We, the samples aren't a thing you can really keep, but we we uh, we got rid of all of this. Next, thanks. Um, so we we also did you know, looked at chemicals, turnover of stock, pharmaceutical advertising, as I said, um, and then from a leadership point of view, we we did sort of join a, a group of like-minded practices in the area, um, and then at the time there was a government group um, or government a Victorian government um, uh, process that was was looking at encouraging businesses and personal um, in personal action to deal with your own carbon footprint. Um, thank you, Sujata. So, but we did forget a few things. We forgot transport. I mean, doctors love their cars, uh, particularly um, as you as you get older, you seem to um, become more enamored with them. Um, this was a surprise. So keep going, thank you, Sujata. Um, our, our car park had a lot of four wheel drives in it. It had one Tesla um, from one of my colleagues, and you can see there, particularly if you look at the last column, that if you if you get this this is sort of um, uh, distilling the fuel use back into kilowatt hours, and you can see that if you drive a large four wheel drive um, and you do fifteen thousand kilometres a year, it's essentially using um, nine kilowatt hours um, per per day, which is which is about a third of what you'd use in a home. Thank you. So there's a couple of options. You can spend $100,000 on a Tesla uh, Model D. Next, thanks. Or if you can, you know, this you can keep fit, set a good example, um, and um, the only carbon emissions there are, are basically what, what your own body is producing. Thank you. Um, we we put a big poster up in in our room in our rooms just showing uh, well, what we what we've been doing um, with some uh, references at the bottom. Thank you. And this this was a, a, a group a fledgling group um, with with a number of practices sort of in the area where where we were sort of doing so. Um, similar sort of things. Um, we have a website. Uh, like most things, I think you know we sort of rode the wave of enthusiasm. Um, but I think without a dedicated um, uh, group and without some sort of professional involvement, particularly from something like a, a primary health network, um, this has sort of gone into somewhat of a hibernation. Next, thanks. So, um, you know, there are resources around. Um, thank you, Sujata. So there's, um, you know, lots of really good resources around. There's the Global Green Healthy Hospitals, um, which you can find online. There's the Climate and Health Alliance, uh, the Doctors for the Environment, of course. Um, we've got a very good website. Next, thanks. Um, there's publications that you can get for free, um, which which give some very um, well uh, referenced and clear messages about climate and health and the science of climate change. Thanks, Sujata. Oh, this is sorry. I just put this in here, um, Gerard. This was something um, I found when I was researching this that the Sydney North PHN has actually put together a climate and health strategy 2020. So I oh. just wanted to throw them in there, just in case oh, well, um, well, well, our local PHN is keen to do something. Sorry, did you yeah, want to look, say something? Well, about I, I think as um, as Jenny from your PHN has said, I mean, at the moment, COVID is sort of taking up all the headspace. Um, mm. But there really is a role for the Primary Health Network to, to sort of auspice um, this sort of action. You know, I think, as I said at the beginning, um, uh, um, the minority of doctors really uh, have that sort of fire in their belly to to get out and um, do something about climate change and health and do what they can. Um, but but many many share the views, but um, need need I think the organisational assistance to really put that 
um, into some sort of action. So mm -hmm. Next, thank you. And that's, just that's put uh, the environment. Thank yeah. you for putting that. In. There's a um, really um, there's a recent report that they've put out. Yeah. Now, I, I think in terms of actions that you can do, the other really important thing to do is to not forget that we do have um, member organisations, and probably one of the most um, strong politically um, is the AMA. And you know, the AMA have a climate policy. Uh, they're talking a lot more about it now, um, and that's largely because of younger members in the AMA um, who. Uh, you know, have really asked of their organisation to step up. And at the end of the day, you know, climate change, while it is a health and a social issue, um, it is a political issue. And, um, you know, Australia is still in this um, uh, dilemma of, of wrestling with itself over, over what we'll do about this. So I think um, the AMA, our professional colleges, uh, all have climate policies and we all pay our dues to these in one way or another and uh, either joining them or becoming more active and um, insisting that there's more activity is is um, a sort of a really uh, important thing to do and and pretty easy. Thank you, Sujata. Um, so the broader community, this is just um, uh, a climate leadership uh, program that was running a few years ago in Brunella uh, in Victoria, but we, we live in country towns largely, or or you know rural cities. Um, general practice is very well integrated into communities. You know, we live in them. We live in communities. Um, we we have friends from all sorts of different walks of life. Our children go to local schools. Um, we're part of the community. So there are environment groups in most of our towns and cities, and it, you know, it's a good idea to sort of link up with them and, and encourage our clientele uh, and our colleagues to, to join. Thank you. So what can a doctor do? You can practise good medicine. Um, you can avoid polypharmacy, particularly in the elderly, basically being a good GP. You can use teleconferencing and telemedicine more. Think about how you travel personally. Thank you. And to ask yourself, you know, how green was your electricity day today? So that's the known unknowns. And to join community projects. So a lot of um, towns these days, and particularly um, in northeast here, they've got some very innovative people in our communities who, um, you know, would benefit from from um, their GP support. Thank you, Sujata. And and this is a very handy template to use if you're thinking about what you can do and what you need to think about. This is from the Global Green Health um, uh, Green Hospital, the Global Green Health Hospitals Network, and it's their um, agenda goals for for um, sustainability in your workplace. So. Thank you very much. That's um, all I've got to say, except to um, when we're thinking about the vulnerable in our communities, and this is what it's all about really, um, is to not forget that uh, many elderly people live in homes that are poorly insulated, uh, get very hot, get very cold, um, and um, that more and more they're being identified by our public health officials and, and networks about how we can help them, but um, general practitioners identifying them and um, bringing that up in, in terms of management plans and, um, uh, you know, the, the government, uh, MyGov, um, sort of to help with, with those processes can be very useful. So um, thank you and um, back to you. Thank you, Sujata and Jenny. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, thanks for that. It's really good to see the real practical um, practical things that you've done and also just, um, yeah, how much money you've saved and how much energy with, with yeah, I think that, I think general practices are a great, um, 
location to do all these changes because we have we're open during the daytime so most of our electricity is in the day so solar panels have a really good offset there's lots of lots of things that you've done and they they probably will also they look like they also um make your practice more enjoyable as well when you don't have huge pigeonholes full of advertising and all that paperless systems and everything so lots of win-win yeah. situations yeah and, our, and look our, our staff were um remarkably enthused by this too um it really gave them a uh, a feeling that the practice cared about something other than patients coming in servicing patients and the business side of things that there was a broader view of of the practice and um, that was a really good thing mm, yeah that's cool um awesome so i was i was keen to have a bit of discussion um i'm not sure jenny can people turn their microphones and their videos on so we can actually hear from them because i just wanted to so open up to they yeah. Yeah. So we don't have um, a huge number of people on. So I think it would be ideal for um, being able to have a discussion. Um, they can't mm. turn their videos on, but they can uh, turn their microphones on. They can also mm. um, put their, their hand up, their virtual hand. So if anybody would like to say anything, if you could just put your hand up, um, and then I'll, I'll say your name and you'll be able to um, discuss whatever you would like. The other thing you could do is type questions into the question box. Um, it, it would be good though if we could have a discussion um, and we do have that capability. So if anyone wants to put their hand up and then unmute their mic, they can certainly um, talk. Ah, yes, Michelle Guppy. I think you might be muted. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, now. Yes, yep. we can. You now. Oh, good, thanks. Um, thanks to Jada and Gerard for such a fantastic presentation. Um, it was really, really interesting. And um, so Jada, I'm going to hit you up to uh, give that talk to some medical students next year. Um, but yeah, just just really interesting to hear an overview of um, the health, the direct health effects of climate change right now. Um, and I think that, yeah, two things that are striking is that this is not just something that we're thinking about into the future. Uh, it is stuff that is happening in our communities right now. Um, and just the fact that healthcare in Australia contributes 7% of Australia's carbon emissions, I mean, that's enormous. Um, and so it was really great, Gerard, to hear just just the specific detail of what you guys did down there. That, that was just very practical um, because I sort of, you know, I've been thinking about this, and um, but but didn't really know. All right, what are the steps that you take, um, and what are the things that actually make the most impact? So that was very helpful in just um, just hearing all about that. I'm just wondering, have you have you written that up anywhere um, so that other people can know what you did? Uh, well, it, it's on our it's on the um, Northeast Sustainability website. Um, but oh, also, cool. uh, and it's also on our practice um, website. So that's um, okay. Uh, Church Street Surgery. Um, so it, it's Church Surgery Benalla. So that that's on there. And um, I, I have written it up. I've, I've written an article which um, we're um, submitting to the MJA. But um, it's not a it's not a um, a learned academic article, but um, it's uh, hopefully sort of going to make it in there at some stage, but just just about where we got to and um, how we got there. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. I'll have a look at those um, those websites um, because it's just yeah, just very useful to know that the actual practical steps. Sure. Yeah, so I think I think on that on that website there's a. Um, uh, a case discussion which is which has got the details 
Okay. And if you have any problems, um, you can certainly um, contact me via Jenny and, and I can email you whatever you need. All right, thank you very much. That would be great. Yeah, that, I think that, that, um, that wasn't, I, I wasn't Jesus Christ in the middle of that picture either. I, I, I was right on the end, out in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah, but I, I loved your joke about being an old fossil. <laughs> I think, um, Gerard, when I first um, found, I can't remember where, where I, how I came across you, but somehow I managed to get in touch with you a couple of years ago. And I think you, I, from memory, you sent me a whole lot of useful information as well. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for being, um, yeah, sharing no, your knowledge. No, and, and I think, I think, you know, um, uh, a lot of this is, you know, is purely self-interest. You know, the the um, our our practice. Our, you know, we're, we're a business group, um, and um, it really had to tick those boxes of, of making sense financially. So, um, you know, I think I think in terms of pride before the fall. You know, we we thought we had a well-run business, um, but we didn't realise just how much waste we we had. And you know, ultimately. Um, the whole issue about you know climate change and mitigating climate change uh it's it's just a win-win you know anything you look at um actually has the per, a, a dimension of of um financial gain when when you take into account um you know being you know, having bringing s sustainability you know front and foremost either personally or into your business and um, financial gain for our patients too. You know, you prescribe less, um, you you think more broadly about their health, and and it ultimately makes for a healthier living, but but um, saves saves their financial resources. Mm. Yeah, and I think there's so many solutions that are like win-win in many different ways. Like like um, in, as part of this climate and health project, we're talking about. It's strengthening local food networks and the community garden and if we get people like we're also sort of talking about trying to revitalize the aboriginal community garden in which like that'd sort of help people help provide some um fresh food and some gardening skills and get people outside like sort of digging in the land and all that kind of stuff so i think all these things have so many so many mm. benefits mm. Yes, yeah, indeed. I, I think um, uh, the other thing you do when you start looking at this sort of thing, it does encourage you, because we started off looking at this from a business point of view, but it does encourage you to, to think about um, your own personal um, lives and about, about how you consume and what you consume and about sustainability in your own families. Um, mm. And you know because because one thing does lead to another, so you know you start off with with um, you know putting in new air conditioners because that makes sense, and the next thing you find that you're riding a bike to work. You know, it's, um, um, it's a good thing. And then you're fitter, and you're saving yeah. fuel, money on fuel. Yeah, <laughs> great. Um, the, the other thing I, I, I didn't mention is. When you're thinking about fire and um, the harm, is you know the other the other flip side of of um, the effect of the fires is the effect of the volunteer firefighters, um, you know who who in the last you know the catastrophic fires we had a year or two ago, um, you know the Benalla group has 60 firefighters and a lot of them were away from their homes for a month. Um, and exposed to risk and seeing terrible things, and um, you know they they do that on our behalf. So I think if you live in a rural community, um, it probably probably does pay to think about you know what they do on our behalf and and what we can do to support them. Um, we, being, we've you know, just had. We've had another question. Um, someone's got their hand up. So, Amy, if you would like to um, ask your question. 
Uh, yes, uh, so first of all, thank you so much, um, Sujata and Gerard. That was fantastic. I scribbled down um, tons of ideas. Uh, my name is Amy Ashman. I'm a dietitian in Armadale. Um, so I have a bit of a dietitian uh, question, um, which is, uh, did you think of um, implementing any sort of um, policies around food in terms of sustainability, um, maybe around catering at events or at work meetings? Um, and, and how do you think that would go down? Um, I'm thinking, sorry, go on. Are you gone, Amy? Uh, I just, um, I asked because um, I've got a friend who's on a, a sustainability committee at, at her workplace, which is not health related um, workplace, um, but they have a policy that 100% of all the food at catering at events is either vegetarian or vegan, which is quite, um, quite impressive. I don't think it would go down so well um, in the in the New England region where we live, but something like a, a sort of uh, maybe a commitment to a, a 50 percent um, of the food provided at events would be would be vegetarian or vegan options or something like that. Yeah, well, look, um, that, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think if we brought it in in vanilla, um, we would be down to about two apostles rather than 12. The others I think, <laughs> would leave the building. Um, but from a personal point of view about, about veganism and vegetarianism, um, it almost doesn't need to be sold anymore. I mean, I, I love meat and, you know, and um, uh, my wife for quite a long time, a number of years now, has been gradually leading us in the direction of vegetarianism. Um, and we, you know, just, just because it tastes so good, um, it, it changes behaviour. So I think, uh, you know, with, with Otto Lingi and the other, um, you know, vegetarian um, chef gurus, um, you know, there's so many delicious recipes around. And, and from a personal point of view, um, you know, uh, whereas, you know, I chain myself to the barbecue, um, you know, I look forward to our vegetarian meals. So while we haven't as a practice thought about um, food, um, personally, we have, mm. and I think the other thing we could probably do as a practice is to um, is look at our garden because we've got a garden out front which we have a gardener. But maybe we could actually have some vegetable growing in there and encourage people to take some herbs or um, you know some seasonal produce when they come and visit. Um, so, so there are those sort of things that add to the whole. Um, you know, it's quite a welcome thing, I think, if we did that. We we, we haven't gone down that road, but that would be, um, you know, something we could do. Oh, yeah, that would be a lovely thing for clients as well, if they were could um, pick some herbs on their way out. So that would be that would be lovely. Um, and my other my other question is actually for um, for for people who um, whose health service may be in a shared building, so they might not be able to to control, for example, if they could buying a from a renewable energy um, provider because we share electricity with other um, offices in the building. Have you got any advice around that? Because obviously one of the most significant things that, that you can do, or, um, or most of the most significant things you can do involve actually um, owning the premises that you are, um, that you're working out of and not renting in a shared building. So are the, what are the sort of biggest things that we could do for people who are in that situation? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very common problem um, because, you know, a lot of practice, general practices are owned by a corporation now um, and the uh, general practitioners um, who run their own practice might actually be renting their premises. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't have the scope to, you know, alter the building envelope so much. Um, I think if you're in a shared building where the elect, you know, the electricity is being supplied, you know, to one meter, mm. um, and that becomes, uh, you know, impossible without the um, the agreement from the other people that who are receiving the electricity from the provider. Mm. But I think if you've got separate meters, even though it's a shared building, um, mm. I think you know you should you should investigate whether whether you can purchase electricity, you know, from a different provider. I mean, okay. the, the, the plethora of providers gives the, 
impression that, you know, if you uh, say you go with um, Origin Energy or, or um, PowerShop or something like that, that when you turn your computer on, the electrons that, you know, come from them, but they, they don't, they're, they're supplied through the, the same channels that that's just um, processed, uh, the accounts are processed in a different way. Mm. So you, you, if there's a separate meter, I, I think you probably would be able to do that. Mm, okay, thanks, something to investigate. Thing, uh, green energy is the price has come down a lot. Uh, mm. When we went to the green power, it was um, eight cents a kilowatt hour extra. Um, I think mm. it's down now about five or maybe four cents a kilowatt. Mm. And that makes that makes a um, a big difference. Not just a feel good thing. It actually those that energy that you purchase is um, when it when it's accounted for is over and above the renewable energy target. So it actually does support um, you know getting to net zero um, by 2050 and moving the whole energy grid in the direction that it needs to go. Mm. Great, thank you. Pleasure. Ah, yes, we do have someone else with their um, hand up and that's Brian Connor. Brian, if you would like to ask your question. Can you hear me? Yeah. You can hear me? Yes, Brian. we can. Sorry, all I want to know, thank you, Jared. wonderful. I know a bit about Bunnell and that part of Victoria, so it's good to see your face. Question is, do you have, any, being a country GP, do you have much relationship with the local hospital? Can you influence what they're up to in terms of energy sustainability? Um, yeah, look, we do. We have a lot to do with our local hospital. We're, it's a, um, essentially a GP-run hospital. Um, and, and this that, that's an interesting question because it does raise the whole um, uh, issue of siloing of of the health industry as such that everybody's doing their thing but often in isolation um, the the hospital um, you know they are they are mandated by the Victorian government to um, institute various sustainability um, actions I think they've now got about 150 kilowatts of um, solar energy on the roof. Uh, they've got um, uh, various sort of storages for uh, water. Um, they've they've done all the landscaping is done in a way that sort of conserves water, um, and also in the way they handle waste. So so they're very much you know government focused, and they you know they've got key performance indicators that they have to make. But they don't um, uh, interact with with anybody else. Um, they they report to head office basically. Uh, but they've been interested uh, in forming a partnership um, with with health providers in the area um, to to support community based you know sustainability action. So you know because that. Um, most health services have a community health centre, and part of their part of their role is um, public health and um, uh, climate change, sustainability. You know, at its heart, a public health issue. So, um, both our, our base hospital has been quite supportive um, and have, um, facilitated various meetings and hosted events. Um, and our local his hospital have made the right noises, but. Um, again, you, there's, it, it's difficult. You've got to get the right person. You've got to give um, uh, the the board and the CEO really have to have to want to do it. But, but Thank you. Rural um, hospital, their communities as well. So you know they're happy to jump on board. Thank you. I had a, um, a thought when you were responding to that. Um, Gerard, that there's some um, there's some really amazing examples of small hospitals doing um, great things with sustainability. Like on the Global Green Healthy Hospital, there's a report from Kuriwrap, um Health Service, which I don't. It's somewhere in Victoria. I don't know if it's anywhere close to Banana. 
down in Gippsland. Uh, okay, yeah. But they're, I mean, their CEO is very, very on board and they've done things like, I think, have local food in the hospital, they've put solar paddles, they've done huge amounts of things. Um, so I think, yeah, if you have a, if you have even a couple of very keen staff members um, that can push the executive to um, start doing this kind of thing, that's sometimes all it takes. And for example, like I, when I worked at the um, Westmead Children's Hospital in 2014, I think, or 15, um, myself and another junior doctor went around to the various heads of department and said, hey, do you think our hospital should be more sustainable? And everyone said, yeah, that's a great idea. So we took all that to the CEO um, saying, hey, all these heads of department think that we should be doing more. Um, and the CEO was also on board, luckily. Um, but yeah, and basically hired a sustainability officer and we formed a sustainability committee. Um, and so I think sometimes it only takes a couple of um, a couple of keen people just to kind of take that to executive and the higher up people and say that this is something important and yeah, changes. Then, then some, if it's kind of put in the structure of the hospital, then that change can happen. Um, yeah. no, no, no. I remember um, speaking to the um, inaugural sustainability officer at the Marsh Hospital in Queensland. Um, mm. His his role was um, uh, when it was created. The the CEO said, "We're going to fund you for a year, and your goal is to pay for your salary in the first year." Mm. Our savings. Yes. So so that's what he did, and he hit that goal the first year, and he doubled it in the subsequent years. So um, yes, a, a bit bit like a bit like um, you know, the financial impetus is that is that um, you know the money. And, and hospital guidelines won't do things unless it actually makes financial sense. But um, you know, fortunately, it does. Mm, that's cool. The, the, the only only thing it couldn't change was um, uh, the Martyr Hospital um, had their own coal burner, their own coal um, wow. boiler, where, where they generated all their hot water, um, mm. and you know, they, they'd get trucks coming in from a coal mine somewhere. Uh, and they, they were they were absolutely wedded to it. So I think I'm, I'm not sure whether they've changed it, but at that stage they'd done all this fantastic sustainability work, but were still, um, you know, trucking in coal for their coal-fired power plant. Wow, that's crazy. Hmm. Well, we haven't got any other questions. Um, just before we go, has anybody would anybody else like to say anything? Um, I have a question um, maybe for you, Jenny, or, or the PHN. Um, what do you think, like, how could the PHN support practices? Like, what kind of structures or processes or something do you think could PHN? I have no idea, but I will um, certainly take it to our CEO and see what um, maybe we can come up with. Um, yeah, so my manager was just texting me asking how it's all going and we're going to check out Sydney North uh, PHN and have a look at their um, strategy and um, yeah, see what we can come up with. Um, tonight's been really good. It's very refreshing to be talking about something different apart from COVID. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Um, and it was just very interesting and, and even, you know, ideas to do in your own home. I think it's great. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, this is accredited with RACGP and ACRAM. So fill in the evaluation um, and I can upload your points and we will have a copy of this on the website. Um, thanks everyone and I will see you at the next webinar. Thanks so much, Jenny. Thank you, thank you very much, Jenny.